Hi, and welcome to One Hour of uh, Feed. Today I have with me my co-host, uh, uh, Mr. Dodgy, or Michael Duke, as uh, you, you're legally called, and I'm Peter Heiner Nilsson, and we're going to spend the next hour basically debating perhaps uh, the topical things within the, the world of chess politics, and uh, then we will also talk especially about uh, cheating in the end. But first of all, so welcome to, to you, Mr. Dodgy. Thanks very much, Peter. It's good to see you. Um, yeah, there's been a lot happening in the chess world this week. There's been a lot of uh, accusations thrown around, a lot of videos made. I think we'll get a bit more into them later in the, the episode. But I think last week, I think we had some fair criticism that we didn't talk enough about FIDE, which I feel is misleading the, the fan, the one fan. Uh, so what's what's happened this week in the chess world? Well, I'm actually going to start out with the U European Chess uh, Federation, but it's, it's also kind of part of uh, FIDE, right? But um, there was a European Chess Championship. It was won by Serbia ahead of uh, Germany to sort of spoil the result. But in terms of chess political things, I'll actually start with praise. One thing I really liked about the event was that the last round, they didn't change the schedule. I mean, this mm -hmm. we see very often, that the last round, we start three, four hours earlier, and these poor guys who've just gotten used to some kind of rhythm, suddenly, when the gold medals are at stake, they have to play maybe the, the most important game of their life, and it's moved forward like three, four hours. It crashes sleep, it crashes preparation, all these kind of things. And the only reason that it's done is probably to have the closing ceremony at some kind of decent hour. And here, actually, they chose to, we care about the chess, and they put the closing hour, you know, around midnight or whatever. And um, yeah, the pictures will be there anyway. There will be some guys with a trophy if, if no one is blocking the view, this kind of stuff. But that I really, really like, uh, I have to say. But um, well, that's as much praise as I will have it for, for, the, for today. But I guess you as a media guy, you agree, right? Or maybe not. Um, oh, no, I, I definitely agree as a, as a fan. I think it, mm -hmm. it's much better to have the, the round at the same time every day. Um, because as a fan, we don't really care about the closing ceremony. Usually it's not broadcast, and if it is, it's not particularly interesting anyway. Um, but no, we, we want to watch the chess. I mean, the, the only... I think there is one reasonable justification to sometimes make it earlier, and that's if there is going to be a blitz or rapid tiebreak. Um, but in the case of this tournament, that wasn't what happened. So the, I think, yeah, they should they should always be at the same round every day. It makes it much easier to kind of follow things as a viewer, as a fan. I think, yeah, that's a fan perspective. But I think also for, for a player, I mean, if you actually cut like four hours, they have to take it from somewhere. And it's going to be preparation. It's going to be sleep. And it just feels weird that uh, when things are decided, we suddenly the chance to, to change the, the rhythm. But again, from a fan perspective, having the finals on a the final round on a Monday, is there any reason for that? Or it doesn't matter yeah, for chess, I, maybe? I think, I'm not sure what the actual numbers are, um, but I think it doesn't matter hugely, has been okay. my experience. Um, but yeah, I think in general, you would probably, I mean, I think if you look at the Champions Chess Tour, which usually ends at the weekend, or at the very least on a Friday, um, they tend to be a bit more consistent. And I would guess that they look very carefully at what the viewership numbers are because that's something that matters uh, almost more than anything to them. Um, with events like the European Team Championship, the viewership is never going to be massive, even though they have a lot of strong players. So my guess is that they you know, they schedule these things when they can. Like, it's they have to factor in hotels, they have to factor in you know, the schedules of the organizers who... You know, it seems silly to say we should work around the organizers, but the reality is they're the ones who are putting all the work in. So if they, if it needs to start on a certain day and end on a certain day because they need to be somewhere else afterwards, I think that's just the way it is. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, also, well, you can see at this kind of uh, tournaments, be it the European uh, Club Cup for teams or for here for 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 national teams. My recollection is that they are always put on hotels. At basically the end of season or slightly off season, simply in a, uh, to be able to get a good deal. And uh, perhaps this is just a reality. And maybe also, well, while the European Chess Championship is somewhat important, if you put it on a Sunday, you risk that uh, there is a bigger sporting event that day. On a Monday, we kind of have it for ourselves, I guess, right? So maybe yeah. it makes some sense. 
Um, another thing I've really gotten used to with these team events, but I still hate it, but it will be interesting to hear your opinion on it, is the, the tiebreak system. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it strikes me as completely insane. You know, well, it's also interesting. We sit there with spreadsheets in the end, but the tournament finishes and no one really knows who's won. It's mm -hmm. nuts, isn't it? It, yeah, I didn't follow all of that too closely. So the obviously the first score, the the tiebreak is match points. That's the first score, right? Yeah, of course. And then well, after that, is it board points or is it does it immediately go to Sonnenberg? No, board board points is definitely not uh, because well, board points. Then the problem is, let's say you make a draw in the first round, then you get a more easier opponent, you beat them four zero. And uh, suddenly you will have a bunch of bot points like this. So, well, that happened you, in the wait, beginning. Wait, wait, wait. You mean by winning games of chess? I understand, <laughs> but there is quite a difference between, um, well, the level of opponents you, you get in, in a way. So they made this uh, rule that you get your tiebreak becomes the number of bot points you got against an opponent multiplied with their number of match points. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem is sometimes it works well, but also sometimes it doesn't. For instance, the Olympiad, it doesn't work too well because um, if you do a little bit badly in the beginning, you might get a team that, although they have more than 50%, are way too weak to play against the top teams. So you beat them 4-0. It's simply, I mean, if you have 40 teams that are not that different in strength, maybe it works. But when you have much weaker teams, and they are still, if much weaker teams are more than 50%, then you will get to play them at some point. And if you cross them 4-0, uh, it gives you a, a massive tiebreak. I think actually at some point, Armenia won ahead of Russia in some Olympiad. And while it was a good story, if you look at rating performance or anything like this, it was just uh, unjust. Russia has been leading all the way. But Armenia had beaten some team 4-0. And uh, it was more or less what happened again this time. I think, well, the, the decisive match was uh, Turkey against Iceland, I think. And it basically... Um, well, the goal fight was between Germany and, and Serbia. And Serbia won the last match 3-1. Uh, Germany won 2.5, 1.5. But it all came down to um, that Iceland-Turkey was 1-1. One, one, and Iceland uh, had a position, a pawn down, and they had a position uh, with Rook against Rook and Knight. So two defendable endings. But uh, the championship was hanging on it. If Iceland defends both, Serbia are champions. And uh, if they lose one of them, Germany is champions. And this took like half an hour. And um, Iceland managed to defend them and um, Serbia was the champions. But here, actually, because the German chess federation, well, they're Germans. So they have their spreadsheet, they set with everything uh, calculated. So we actually knew who had won at that point. But I remember the Olympiad in Dresden. I think it was... Ukraine, who was celebrating women's gold for half an hour, and then when someone the tournament was over and someone pressed the button, Georgia had won, or the reverse. But well, we actually no, when the players themselves doesn't realize who has won when everything is over, that's not ideal, right? Yeah, that's true. But I mean, you can also just sort of solve all of these problems with board points. Like you yeah, don't have I any of these issues with board points. You go into the last round, you know exactly what you need to do to win the tournament in the last round. Mm -hmm. uh, because you can have scenarios where you know a team will need to win four zero, so they know what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And I think as uh, for the players to understand what is happening is better, and for the spectators, it's much more interesting as well. And I, 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 I don't have a problem with rewarding people for winning games of chess. So you know, if you rack up points against lower rated teams, that's fine because it's not easy to do. Well, the problem is that some of the games you win might actually be quite easy to win. And that I think the problem is it becomes unjust. I would generally suggest maybe rating performance rather than board points. But I fully agree with you. The players need to know the situation. I mean, uh, before the last round. You need to understand we need to win or they, well, they need to draw something like that. But, um, well, but a question is why do we have this situation? In other sports, they have a final. My theory is that in other sports, they don't mind sending people home. I mean, basically, you get sort of uh, excluded from the tournament when you have done badly enough. That mm -hmm. we never do in chess, right? And it's difficult to do in chess because there isn't enough money in chess. You know, I guess Ten you are hitting Ten tennis the, the tournaments. Nail here. I guess is the easiest comparison in terms of you know an in, in individual sport, but they're 
the kind of standard tournament is a knockout. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, we, we couldn't afford to do that every week because a lot of people would just be playing one game of chess or two games of chess and then going home. And, you know, the World Cup is a fantastic event, but it's super expensive uh, for the players as well as the organizers. Um, but, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, with more money, it could be more viable. You know, the, the Champions Chess Tour does have a knockout element in in basically every event now. I th- although I think the finals is just a round robin. I'm not totally sure. In, in um, the old days, I think with Olympiads, you would have some kind of group stage. And then everybody mm-hmm. would stay there. But they would play like an A final, a B final and such. But probably it took like three weeks, uh, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, there are ways to do things. I think if you, for example, as someone suggested there, like there should be open tournaments of running alongside the World Cup, um, so mm-hmm. that if you get knocked out and you're, you know, a professional chess player, which it, we are only talking about professional chess players for amateur events, knockouts are never going to make sense. Um, but for 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 you know professional players, if they could. F- be knocked out of the World Cup, but okay, there's an open tournament I can play here, or even, you know, a series of round robins that they could play Mm -hmm. uh, and just go into after each round finishes. That would kind of make up for things and it would decrease the cost. And then perhaps you could have like a mini World Cup with, you know, 64 players, but half of them go out in the first round and then they play, you know, a Swiss or whatever. There, yeah, but I'm thinking these team events. But well, mm-hmm. you call the professional players, but especially at an Olympiad, but even European Championship, it's not a professional event uh, on average, right? I mean, at the Olympiad, is is kind of more a social event, I would say. Yeah, I don't think it would ever make sense at an Olympiad, and I think you know there's far too many players who do combine it with a holiday. Like, let's be realistic. This is a mm-hmm. you know, it's a serious event at the top level, but. Most people, I think, at the Olympiad have to have a real job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when we are combining these things that, are, well, everybody plays the same event. It's a beautiful idea and it's very hard to solve, actually. I mean, I'm sure you can improve on the tiebreak system, but I think the main problem is that at Olympiad we have 180 teams and you have to decide it in 13 rounds. It's not going to be very easy. Uh, and if you are not willing to send people home, and I think that's quite reasonable. I mean, this guy traveled from all over the world. As you said, they took two weeks of holidays. If you sort of knock them out after four days, uh, well, it's going to ruin everything, right? So Yeah. yeah. Although uh, I think a final, you know, with the top four teams going through to a, a mini mm-hmm. knockout, an Olympiad would make sense. Like, I think it doesn't extend the tournament too far. You know, it's an extremely expensive event to have so many... Yeah, yeah. You know, a couple of thousand chess players and a couple of thousand officials for the FIDE Congress, as well as you know, all the costs oh, involved I'll... with that. It's a it's a pretty expensive event, and I think extending it for a couple of days for the top teams probably wouldn't break the budget too much. Um, so no, I think it would be an interesting. There option. is probably p- possible to find some kind of solution that is somewhat better, but um, yeah. Anyway, uh, Serbia won. I think, well, as it is a chess political podcast, they have uh, two former Russian players on the team, right? They have Salama and, and Pretke. Mm-hmm. And, and they chose to, to represent Serbia. And generally, I'm a huge fan of it. I mean, that's basically what I have been talking for, that, well, we don't want to discriminate Russian players as long as they choose to represent something else. I mean, playing for Serbia, I mean, the Russian media is not going to praise them and call them uh, Russian players in any way. So in that sense, it... it that thing I think is great. Of course, the problem is that two Serbian players didn't, former Serbian players didn't manage to get on the team, for instance. And I have seen this criticism made in other countries that uh, former Russian players takes up space on the team. I don't know if that a general conflict or only a couple of places. Yeah, I guess it's always been a, a touchy subject when people change countries. Um, I mean, I guess players switching to America has probably been more controversial yeah, yeah, over the past. Okay. Close. past few years um but yeah i mean I, I i don't really care i think these i think if people want to play for a country they they can but i don't think these kind of i, I think flags are stupid <laughs> yeah <laughs> i find it very hard to kind of take it seriously um because these teams are just like i think it's a fun event and i think it's cool to like follow your local players but like 
realistically, most of these players are playing for these teams it's purely by chance. Like <laughs> it's just an accident of where you were born. Um, yeah, some some truth in it. Also, I mean. Both Sarama and Pretka actually have uh, Serbian citizenship by now. I mean, it's, it's mm. not uh, it's not any kind of criticism, but uh, I'm just saying it's a typical thing that when new players arrive to a country, one has to remember that someone gets pushed out of the team. And uh, mm. I, I, well, I know personally, it always le- leads to some kind of uh, debate for uh, things like yeah, that. for sure. And it was the same, I think, with the England team. Obviously, that mm-hmm. pushes someone out with Vichigov playing for them, um, but. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I think maybe none of those guys want to play in the Asian Championship. Maybe that's their main reason for a switch. Yeah, yeah. Are, are, have, is there an Asian team championship and that Russia have played in, or did not, this? No, that? I don't think. I think also, I'm not sure they were invited for the first one. I'd also, I guess, for 2024, it could start happening. There is also this thing called. Uh, Asian Games. I'm not sure if there is an Asian Championship just uh, as a standalone in chess, but there has uh, yeah. been this Asian yeah. Games, which is part mm. of a bigger thing. And I don't know if Russia is part of that, and I don't know if they can just play in uh, in summer event or not, and not the, the whole whole event. To, to be honest, so mm. that, uh, believe it or not, I have actually not followed in great uh, detail. Yeah, because because the I, Asian I, Games was part of a bigger kind of yeah, not yeah. Olympic I mean, thing, but semi Olympic. Kind of, I mean, the Asian game, I think sports. for Europeans, uh, at least I remember earlier, sort of not understanding how big it was for, for the Asian players. I think maybe mm-hmm. uh, was I, when I was working for Vichy, perhaps Ganguly won a medal there, or maybe Kasim Djanov won a gold. And this was really huge in their countries. Asian games is something they pay a lot of attention to. And just because in Europe, we don't really have anything similar, right? I mean, well, we care about the... The Olympics, and then we care about our our own sporting events. Well, in football, for instance, those European football matters. But uh, mm-hmm. um, no, this kind of Asian Games, which is a sort of small, real Olympiad, is huge, and uh, I think they got huge bonuses. But also, just the attention it was given was was very surprising to me. So that's yeah. a, that's a very cool, cool thing, no doubt. Yeah, no, it was a very serious event. I saw that most of the teams sent. Yeah. basically their full yeah. strength team. I guess China had maybe a slightly weaker team, but they always seem to do that and do in, fine. So <laughs> in the in the beginning China was sending their best lineup. Nowadays, both with World Championship and Asian Games, as you said, they seem to send the B or C team and they might win anyway, right? Um, it's um I I have absolutely no insight to what they what they are doing in China, but although that it seems to to work quite well. Uh, that that's all I can say. Um Another went moving towards FIDE is that, uh, well, we will have the FIDE Rapid and Blitz World Championship during uh, Christmas and New Year. It's normally there, so it's not a big surprise, but a bit anyway. There was quite some controversy. One thing was that it was announced only just recently, less than uh, two months before. That must be completely unique in the world of sports, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... I don't think that can reasonably be justified. You know, FIDE have been very clear that they want these dates for the World Rapid and Blitz. So, like, I don't think it's unreasonable to announce the venue after the next event finishes. Like, like, or basically at the event. You know, you give out the prizes and you go, next year we'll be in this place. Like, I don't think that's unreasonable because they know the dates. They, you know, they know what they want to do. Um... But with the the controversy about it being at Christmas and, you know, people don't want to travel at that time of year, I kind of do think FIDE have got the right idea with being consistent with the dates. You could certainly argue that it should be at a different time of year, but I think the it gets very good viewership on Norwegian TV. And it honestly is probably worth having it then just for the kind of viewership that it does get with the Norwegians, assuming Magnus will play. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people do kind of want to sit around and watch stuff at that time of year. If you're chilling out at Christmas, then I think it's decent time to, you know, a lot of people are off work. Um, so, I, yeah, I really don't have a problem with it being at that time of year. Other than the fact that maybe one year I would like to go as a spectator and that would be yeah. very, very difficult to get past my wife. So, mm-hmm. Well... Ask. We can have her as a guest on the show and discuss it if you want at some point. But yeah, uh, else I'm not really sure I can help you there. But no, I mean, I have been coaching Magnus a lot of times with his World Rapid and Blitz. But I think 
He's only asked me to go once, and that fit me quite well. I have small children. Christmas matters. But I agree with you. This is top-level professional sport, right? And, um, well, chess seems to have found a niche in terms of that this time we actually get a bunch of exposure. I think it works incredibly well. As you mentioned, uh, it's a huge tradition nowadays by Norwegian television. Most likely Norwegian television is, is paying quite some, some money for that. And, and that seems to work well. I think also for the chess environment, there is a hole in the calendar there. Where else to put it is a bit uh, weird. Um, but of course, this not knowing the venue, of course, you can argue if you know the date, you reserve them. The venue is not that important to know. But still, I think this year there was also some uncertainty. Does the event happen at all or is it moved or things like that? I think there was rumors of, of different venues and different times even. And uh, no, I don't know. And also the venue is uh, Samarkand in uh, Uzbekistan. I saw some complaining that that's very far away. But in principle, any place is far away in, in the world. It just depends on where you're located yourself, right? But um... Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't agree that, you know, all tournaments should be in Europe. Like, I think that would be absurd. And I think in general, I'm pretty supportive of tournaments being in unusual places, Uh because I think the benefit to chess is probably bigger. You know, like, uh, I suspect more people will get interested in chess when it's in somewhere that doesn't have a chess culture rather than it being in the middle of, you know, somewhere that already everybody kind of follows chess anyway. Although you can do, certainly do both and they should do both and it should probably maybe alternate. Um, but I think the last one was in Kazakhstan, which is reasonably close to Uzbekistan. Um and I, I'm not sure where it was before that. Is it Poland before was it that? Was it Warsaw? Warsaw, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's only two in a row in that area of the world, although obviously other events have been there as well. Um, But, yeah, I don't think it's... I mean, I did look specifically at Samarkand in terms of trying to get there, and it's definitely not the easiest airport to get to. Um. But yeah, I, I, direct plane from Istanbul. I think if you are sort of uh, coming from Europe, I think I checked from myself. I would have to go via Istanbul. I also typed in in a search engine St. Louis to uh, Samarkand just to check out if Caruana had a point, and he had a point. It basically said there's no co- good connections. So mm-hmm. I would be surprised if Caruana plays. I, I would love if he does. I think that would be cool, but. I mean, if you sit there, you're playing the single field cup. After what, you have to make a decision. You start checking. It's two hour, sorry, two days traveling there. Maybe you think, okay, stuff it. I'm just going to skip this year. I yeah, mean, and that that's unfortunate if you know players are forced to make that decision. But I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you could definitely argue that tournaments should be closer to international hub airports, especially when it is a tournament where everyone in the world is. You know, you, we're expecting basically someone from every country to turn up. So, but you can't always have that. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't mind the the choice of venue, other than it is, um, you know, another very Russian friendly country, which I think is a pattern at this point. But. Yeah, uh, well, you say Russian friendly country. I will more say that it's uh, it's almost a battlefront. Like, uh, not not no battlefront sounds very wrong because there's not nothing to do with actual fighting, but. Uh, a state where, let's say, the West and Russia is fighting for for influence. So the same you saw with Kazakhstan, right? That, uh, well, they are being friendly with Russia. Some say they are omitting sanctions. Then you will have the, the U.S. president visiting, and you will go in the other direction. There's definitely some some games going on there. But it's hard not to look at um, the political uh, aspect of it. Of course, also Samarkand uh, opened a Russian consulate just uh, a month ago or something like this. And, uh, well, it's always hard to prove these connections. It's also very hard not to see them if you have a bit of a suspicious mind, which uh, goes for at least the two of us, right? So, Not at all. I'm not suspicious of anything. Ah, good. Sorry, then it's just, just, <laughs> just, me, just me then. And I think also, well, I think part of the problem that these events are difficult to plan is also... It's not that easy to get sponsors and organizers. I don't know if there even is an official uh, bidding uh, sort of um, what it, process, but um, at least the sponsor seems to be the usual suspects, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, Freedom Holding and uh, Kaspersky. 
Which Although Kaspersky. if Kaspersky is a real sponsor, we don't really know. It's not obvious they're paying something, right? Yeah, I don't, I'm not really sure what they... <laughs> I don't know why Kaspersky are still involved in things. Apparently, this is part of their World Chess deal from 2018, as yeah. the CEO of World Chess said on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not really sure. How does that mean that World Chess benefit out of this? I'd be interested to know. Are they also involved with this tournament? Well, um, maybe. I mean, maybe at some point they have to give away the World Championship, and then they had to get compensated by getting, let's say, sponsorship services but not paying for it for future events but but also i mean 2018 is two feet of presidential elections away i mean if you can make binding contracts that far away in the future it becomes also incredibly weird to me i i've never really seen anything like this but um, yeah that that is very surprising that they've managed to uh cling on this long although i guess world chess still does have a certain amount of influence they run the fide online arena um, yeah, I don't but know how that long also, that to, continues for. To, but. Again, also to me, more seems like this online arena is something that uh, World Chess is promoting. FIDE seems to be stuck on some kind of deal, uh, is my impression. It's not like something they seem to overly love, at least. Um, so no, I don't think a, there's any impression that FIDE actually promotes the FIDE online arena no. in under I, any circumstances. Like uh, No, I started getting some emails from them inviting me to, well, just open events, but I guess it's just uh, random commercials rather than FIDE doing anything about that. My, my general impression was that there was not that much friendliness uh, between the two sides there. But, uh, no, we will see. And no, I and don't fr- think so. Um, but I, I do keep seeing adverts on Twitter for the the Fide Online arenas. Ha- often have a prize fund of forty five euros, yeah. and That's I true. I have I would love to know why it's not just fifty euros. That's my main question. I I don't know why they wouldn't just round it up to fifty. Just you know, yeah. No, it's like we no. we only have forty five. I'm sorry. There's, oh, you see, they caught they your attention anything. already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it works. Yeah, I don't know. And, well, of course, Freedom Holding, uh, I have spoken about at length. They are under sort of uh, investigation by U.S. Uh, stock services, I think, and uh, the Ukrainian government have uh, asked FIDE not to, to use them and so on and so forth. But, um, well, they are, they are back sponsoring here. I mean, well, they're connected to Kazakhstan, but apparently also is willing to sponsor in Uzbekistan. It basically strikes me as when there is no other sponsor, we can always uh, get Freedom Holding to, to appear, right? Uh, that that's that's the way I see it, at least. That somehow. Yeah, I I think they've uh, they've also sponsored. I think some of the women's grand prix. I think the women's grand prix in Cyprus was sponsored by them. Well, there um, they actually have quite some business. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, they at the moment they do appear to be the main FIDE sponsor. Um, mm-hmm. I did notice that the, it was only those two sponsors listed, and um not any other companies and also specifically no chess companies which i thought was interesting because i think mm. historically chess.com and chessable have sponsored these tournaments yeah well maybe it can be added later uh, or I don't, I don't know maybe also this deal has expired i'm not uh, maybe it's only world chess who can make uh, eternal deals right but uh... No, I don't know. But but it's true that when you saw the preliminary list of sponsors, there was not a lot there. Typically, you will add some kind of local, uh, well, authorities, uh, tourist board, whatever, this kind of stuff uh, coming up with some, some, some money, right? But also, it's a rather cheap event, I guess, right? Well, you have to provide a price fund, but that's it. It's, is it like around a million or something like this? million uh, euros? I think it's a million dollars, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think for a company like Freedom Holding, it's not a lot. I mean, the sum, well, they are traded for around a billion on the stock exchange and things like this. So I think um, that is probably not a, a huge problem for, for them. As you mentioned earlier, the really, really expensive event in the world of chess, of course, to some extent, is the World Championship match, but is the Chess Olympiad is by far the most expensive, right? Yeah, I believe the budget for the, the Olympiads is around 10 million. Exactly. And World Championship match is at best half of that, right? I'd say. Is it that much for no, organizational I think, well, costs? I mean, I have seen some figures around that, but maybe that's just what FIDE asks for in the in the bidding process. Uh, it sounds also pretty high to me, but let's say with a two million price fund and you add stuff. I mean, that um, 
there you actually have to pay for all the expenses um, at this phase of rapid and blitz. I guess you pay for the prize fund. Everything else is the players themselves, right? Yeah, I think only players over twenty seven fifty get okay. expenses yeah. paid. I'm not sure if it's flights and hotel. I think it just says expenses. And that is perhaps also a bit of the problem. I think many would like to play the World Rapid and Blitz, but if you have to get tickets to Samarkand at short notice, it could be pretty expensive. Add on top of that uh, five, six nights in a kind of expensive luxury hotel. I mean, it's becoming a serious investment. And these guys are professionals, but if they start out with a minus of 3,000 euros, it's not a given they will get it back in any way. No, it's so. it's a tough event. And... Uh... I mean, I guess you don't have to finish, you know, top three or five to actually get some money in these tournaments, which is a positive. But I think if you finish outside the top 10, you're probably yeah. not going to make a profit if you have to pay your own way. Obviously, if, you, yeah. if you're if you above 27.50 and you get your expenses paid, then it's kind of a free but roll. But... There are not a lot of uh, those players, but I mean, take a... Our mutual friend, Mr. Fresinet. I mean, we would generally like to see him play this event, but uh, mm-hmm. to make a bet that he would come positive financially, I wouldn't do it, right? And uh, that's a little bit of a yep. pity in a way. But, yeah, I mean, I, my general view is that there are certain events that FIRE has that are very, very marketable and uh, should be treated as kind of like crown jewels. And mm-hmm. this is one of them, and they should be paying for everyone to go like i understand that that's easy for me to spend other people's monies but i think the world rapid and blitz the world cup the candidates the world championship match i think all expenses should be paid for all the players um and the exception is the olympiad because there's too many Mm -hmm. people there i understand they can't pay for everyone there like that's too much but you know these these five events i think are three days crown jewels that they can they should be able to market at a very, very high level to very big audiences, and you know, I cannot do the math, but generally, I mean, chess suffers from not having all the best players at their events. That's generally a pity. I mean, the same can be seen at well, European Championship. We actually had Magnus playing, but that's a bit of a, a rarity. In general, these events, I mean, you want the best players to pay, right? Play, and if all it takes in chess, no, is they want they want eggs, them to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, but they should want them to play as well. Uh, so, yeah. And um, anyway, anyway, I think we have passed the half hour mark already, and we have a main topic, which is uh, cheating. And uh, well, you're the expert on that, so you, you will uh, go on here, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm definitely an expert on cheating. Okay, so, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about recently about Kramnik has written some. I guess you can call them blogs. Often they're just profile notes, but sometimes he writes a blog as well. And he made a video. And I think at this point, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that he's openly accusing uh, several players, uh, and specifically Nakamura, of cheating on that. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that that's what he's doing. Um, and he I thinks also it's unreasonable, right? Uh... Yeah, he does. I, 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 do, I disagree. And I also think a court of law would disagree <laughs> maybe we'll find out let's see yeah. yeah um and he has also specifically named several players uh over and over again which at this point i think you could also treat as an accusation um the first disclaimer i want to make is that i do work for chess.com so i cannot be entirely treated as a an unbiased source here because he's accusing chess.com's most prominent streamer um, but I'm not involved. I, you know, my job at Chessable more than anything else, and I'm not involved with events. I'm not involved with cheating, anti-cheating, or cheating. Um, and I'm not involved with Hikari. Anyway, I've never spoken to Hikari. Um, but I do think it's very difficult to believe that he has developed a system to cheat at chess, where he is always on camera, always performing at a high level, but also, more or less, always not the best player in the world. Um, He's still, even online, just slightly worse than Magnus. I think the gap is closed over the past couple of years, but I think 
it's an incredibly elaborate system to develop to be able to not be the best in the world. Yeah, I mean, well, also, I think in all forms of chess, Magnus is probably the best. But if we go to Bullet and uh, Quick Blitz, it's not a given. It's uh, Magnus, but Hikaru. I mean, they had some amazing matches. I forgot uh, what they're called. Uh, if they're Speed Chess or if they're Bullet uh, or a Championship or something like this. But it seems like in any other format, we think from, from five minutes till uh, excluding Correspondence Chess, everyone would bet on Magnus, right? But in this format, Nakamura has been good and he's been consistently good. It's hard for me to imagine as as well. Also, I think Kramnik is using financial incentives, but Nakamura has built an incredibly impressive business uh, on, on streaming. I mean, risking that f- for small prices like this would be incredibly insane, right? I mean, yeah. so that so- argument is... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in one of in Kramnik's video, he does talk about prizes quite a lot and the financial incentive. I think one of the mistakes that he makes, um, which I would be so. What I want to start by saying is there are different levels of cheating, and I think it, this is a very broad topic, and I think maybe we won't have time to get through everything today. But I think a lot of people are conflating different ways of cheating in different cheating in different areas together and it makes things very complicated so for example there's cheating at the amateur level which is when a guy like me is playing blitz online and some other you know 2200 2300 players which is on an engine and crushes me this happens all the time it's very frustrating for amateur players it probably is the biggest amount of cheating um but i don't think this has any relevance to cheating on a professional level and i think if anything it's more of a customer service problem that chess.com has to deal with because it annoys the customers but like as far as it is cheating in the professional level goes i don't think it's relevant in any way uh the second kind of level of cheating i would say is title tuesday uh, title Tuesday is a very specific event. It's unique. It's totally unique in the world because you'll have three to 500 titled players playing every week, twice a week. Most of the best players in the world will play in every event, which is insane in itself. You know, like these events attract Magnus and Hikaru and a bunch of other top players. I mean, you are just a common player. You mean you must be over the moon for having something like that. It sounds... For well, the money you invest in it, you're getting an incredible deal, right? Yeah, but also what's quite interesting is that it's... Um, other than Hikaru streaming it, and a couple of other smaller streamers get it, uh, also stream it, there's not a huge viewership for Title Tuesday. Um, oh, really? But what it does do is get... Because Chess.com doesn't do their own commentary for Title Tuesday anymore. Um, and a few other people will stream as well. You know, Gaa streams, most of them, a few others. Um but if more than anything else, it's actually kind of a service to the players. Like the mm-hmm. players really enjoy it. Like you can't get Magnus to play in a tournament of that prize fund. I mean, maybe I could because you know, I can. I did almost. Um, but like realistically, the prize fund is not attracting Magnus and Hikaru and Ali Reza and, and Caruana. Like they're they want to play a strong tournament where they play against other strong players. And yeah. if anything, Title Tuesday is a important service towards titled mm-hmm. players more than anything else um and i no, think, I the, think yeah okay. sorry go on, go on. No. no 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 i just good. wanted to sort of embrace the concept in a way that it is very unique and i think for other organizers it must be frustrating right i mean i can imagine someone asking magnus can we get you to play for ten thousand? he says no no it's way too little and then he will log on and play title tuesdays uh, anyway because he loves it and thinks it's a cool event. It's basically something everyone does. I almost wanted to do it myself. It wasn't because I can't really play chess anymore, but it's such an incredible service. And basically, it's become the convention. The good players just play it and seems to be enjoying it, right? And uh, yeah, well, maybe it's good it's not market so much, because if it was market heavily, maybe players will have to stop undermining their market position to some extent by playing it basically for free, right? Um, 
Yeah, to some extent. But I, I think the players just enjoy it. And I think that's why it's important to protect it. Like it is, it should still be treated as a very serious event because if it's an event where people are playing yeah. half of the games against cheaters, then no one's going to enjoy that. Nobody wants that. Mm-hmm. Um, but Tile Tuesday does present its own unique challenges when it comes to anti cheating because it is taken seriously by the players. But you can't monitor 500 players in a Zoom call. You can't have 500 players with two cameras on. There really is a limit to what you can do, and I think there's a limit to what you can expect. I think there's definitely a possibility of people cheating in Title Tuesday and winning them, but I don't think it happens to a degree that we should be, you know, abandoning the whole concept at this point. And I wanted to look at like, so the players that are winning Title Tuesday are more or less the players you would expect to win Title Tuesday. There are exceptions that are definitely outliers, um, but over since Title Tuesday went to uh, February in 2022, they switched to doing two events per week. So there's a late and an early one. Um, and obviously, Tail Tuesdays run longer than that, but I'm not going to look at the numbers for those ones. So since February last year, Hikaru has won 42 editions of Tail Tuesday, um, which is roughly one in three, I think, which is very impressive. And it's significantly more than anyone else. So let's not pretend that like he's not basically crushing the field. In second place is Andraken, who has won 16. Um, Andraken is, you know, a strong chess player, and he's also was near 2,900 in Blitz over the board. Well, I mean, Andraken has played the candidate tournaments uh, in yeah. 14. He's, he's a, I mean, he's not just a, a good grandmaster. He's not the level of uh, me. He's a well, sub-world elite at some point, right? Yeah, but I mean, he was almost 2,900 in Blitz as well. It, over the board, so like I feel like it, at that time he was probably number two in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's my guess. Maybe you know Hikaru and Magnus were both at that level at that time, but yeah, that's where he, he might be in the top ten in the world in that format now. Maybe he's not, but we're talking about that region, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's definitely been been up there mm-hmm. in over the board chess, and I think we have to assume no one is cheating in over the board blitz. Otherwise, yeah, we can't really. I would be impressed. There's not much we can do. Um, in third place is Dubov. Fourth place there's Magnus, and then fifth. What is Magnus' win win rate? I well, Magnus doesn't play as frequently as yeah. That, that was that is my question. So I, mean, I you haven't said Nakamura checked. wins one out of three. Um, you don't Magnus, know what Magnus. Magnus has won ten, but I don't know how often he plays. Mm-hmm. No. I suspect it's a lot less than than Hikaru. I I mean I don't think Hikaru skips it very often. He does skip it. A, they might actually be higher than one in three because he's probably skipped a few, but I think he's mm-hmm. he's pretty consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's Magnus, it's one ten. Ali Reyes is one eight, and then we come to two players who I think you could reasonably raise your eyebrow at at least, which is Bartnik has won seven, and Jose Martinez Alcantara has won seven as well. So these two players are not. In the same region as you know the first five, let's say you know the first five all have a a very serious track record, at least of over the board blitz, if nothing else. Um, and Bartnik and also, just, Jose just to be sure that uh, at least I am not implying anything, but also you, I have well, I know their names, but I I don't think I have seen them play over the board. So basically, what you're saying is we don't know enough about them, or you're saying that they haven't been impressive over the board. Well, this is where it's maybe slightly more interesting, is that we can definitely... They're, they're both rated around twenty low 2600s in classical chess, but they are actually both over 2700 in blitz for mm-hmm. over-the-board chess. Uh, Jose Martinez in particular hasn't played a lot of over-the-board blitz. He never he doesn't play World Rapid in blitz. I, I actually didn't check if Bortnick has played World Rapid in blitz, but I think he has, and I think he did reasonably well. But I might be making that up. But they're both over 2,700 and over the board chess for Blitz. So I, and they're, you know, still they've won fewer than the the guys who are above them. So I find it hard to say that these are real outliers. Like, well, also, it would be weird if there didn't exist very strong Rodmasters who were specialists in being, well, for instance, 
I assume using a mouse efficiently is very important as well. I mean, it would be weird if such players didn't exist. And uh, from what you have mentioned now, well, it's very little suspicious as far as I can uh, hear. Yeah. And also, I think what's important to point out is that Bornick and Martinez have won seven each in the last two years, which means their prize money from title Tuesday is $7,000 each. Yeah. Over two well, years. If which... you have the skill, skills to cheat at this level, maybe you could put these skills to use somewhere else a bit more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I find it hard to believe that this is, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. they're cheating for... Because, I mean, they both of these guys are regulars in Title Tuesday, I, and I suspect they miss very, very few um, mm-hmm. events. Like, I think they're two of the most active, and, you know, they've won it seven times out of... 140 attempts each, or sorry, 120 attempts roughly each. Yeah. Um, then after that, there's Serana, who is quite young and also over 2,700 blitz. Just became and a European champion. He's the double European champion in individual and for teams. He's not an yep. amateur player, exactly. No. no. <laughs> and then there's MVL, Jean, yeah. Nihal Saren, Fedoseev, mm-hmm. Nepo, and Duda. And that is all the players who have won more than $4,000 in title yeah. Tuesday. Okay. So below, and don't get me wrong, there are people who have won one title Tuesday who are maybe, you know, 2,500 FIDE, which I, okay, I definitely would have questions there. I understand people can have a hot run, but like, there's no one who's won more than $4,000 that is Mm -hmm. 2,500 FIDE. Like, these are all near 2,700. I mean, Nihal, I think, has dropped down below 2,700 again, but I don't think we would be very surprised if Nahal had a 2,800 performance in over-the-board blitz. So, like, I think he's been pretty consistently good at yeah, He did extremely well in this... Uh, I forgot the, 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 the finals. He lost to Wesley So, maybe, right? In this chess.com million-dollar tournament, something like this. But, yeah, uh, I think I think so. he... He, he knocked out Geary in the semi-finals, I'm pretty sure. I, mean, oh, he, I think that well, was a well, speed chess championship. Speed, possibly. I'm not, not sure. But, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, this doesn't really add up. But, you, I mean, there could, of course, be a lot of ch- cheating going on, but not that seems to decide the, the, the winners, right? Um, there, there's definitely a lot of cheating going on. And I think there are definitely people who cheat against most prominent players so that they can mm-hmm. brag that they've beaten yeah. Kramnik or Caruana or Hikaru. Um, so that's it. But so I, I think title Tuesday is definitely, it's vulnerable because there's so many people playing it. Mm-hmm. But from a logical point of view, I think you're like, I don't know which 2,700 plus player needs $4,000 that badly. Not uh... Because everyone below Magnus has won less than 10,000. Like, it really, it just isn't big yeah. money. That's not to say there's not big money in online chess because that's, there very much is. And so the third kind of layer, I think, of cheating is, I'm, I'm going to call it the Champions Chess Tour layer, but mm-hmm. I think this this covers, you know, the Speed Chess Championship, uh, various other events of a kind of a level above Title Tuesday, because these events are for a serious money. Um, the Champions Chester has a massive prize on. I don't know what it is at the moment, but it's like one point five million dollars, something like mm-hmm. that. Um, and you can, and the qualifiers are quite big as well. You can, if you win, if you get through the first qualifying stage, which you only more or less need a fifty percent score, mm-hmm. um, then you're already in the money, and. and th- there, there should be a much better chance of, let's say, f- flying under the radar, right? I mean, you know, you, you could cheat here and there and uh, get into some decent price money. Yes, but the the restrictions, well, the kind of regulations for cheating are also stricter for the Champions Chess Tour. I, I, I am going to assume Speed Chess Championship and kind of Bullet, well, I mean, Bullet Chess probably doesn't matter, but, you know, I'm going to just talk about the Champions Chester, but the qualifier for that, you have to be in a Zoom call and you have to have two cameras on and you have to have you know, the audio has to be on and you're not allowed to wear headphones as far as I know. Um, so, 
and there are also kind of share screen share requirements. You can be asked to share mm-hmm. your screen at any time. The the anti cheating people can ask to go into your task manager. You definitely can't have anything running on the computer. Um, mm-hmm. I I personally played in an event where I got flagged for anti cheating stuff, and they didn't let me listen to Spotify. They were like, "No, you have to turn that off." Um, and I was like, "Okay, this is not not fun for me." But yeah, you know, mm-hmm. they were like, "You can't have anything else running." Um, so what what are they killing? They are basically well, of course, you cannot. So the task manner makes sure that. On your screen, screen you can have nothing running on your computer. So if you want to cheat with an engine, you need to have an extra engine. But they're yeah. monitor, they're monitoring your eyes and they're monitoring sound. So they are saying it's very difficult to get uh, things through to you, right? Yeah, and but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Right? No, because there, you know, you can have two cameras on on a person and not see the entire room. Mm-hmm. There's no way to. I mean, you cannot have a headset, and in principle, you can have a expensive, very small microphone, uh, what is a headphone in in your ear, right? That that should be still be possible. It's possible. They they do ask to look inside people's ears quite often. Wow. Well, um, okay. I don't know how realistic that is because I don't yeah, know. You know, if you're just holding your ear up to a webcam, can you really see? Okay. Also, even if you have something in your ear. You need someone following the games, giving you info very quickly. Maybe it's possible, but... Um... Well, I mean, that's one of the other things, is that these games are also on a delay. Um, are they on a delay? Yeah. So okay. it's not that easy to get the... No. Like, I'm sure there are ways to do it, but I think there's a lot of practical barriers. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I would be very surprised there's definitely ways to do it with this. I, I, I've i thought about it kind of more than a normal person would. And I think I could probably figure out a way to do it. But also, like, if once you're caught, you're basically done. Like, mm-hmm. and I, the, Chester.com has had this kind of second chance policy for people who confess to cheating. And I think... You know, you could definitely make a case that people should be banned indefinitely when they get caught cheating, but I don't think that's really in line with other sports and what happens in other sports. And my preference, my personal preference, is that that is what would happen. Like, I am totally okay with throwing cheaters out and throwing away the key. Like, I have no sympathy with these people. Um, But I think, in like realistic terms. I don't think it's something that aligns with other sports, and I don't think it's it's necessarily a good concept, especially when you know we have professional teenagers playing chess that sometimes they'll cheat. Should should their entire life be over? I I don't know. I think you can still have very severe punishments as they have in other sports. I mean, if you lose one two years of your professional career, that is also quite uh, something, and. Um, well, I guess it depends on the situation. Also, for throwing away the key, we need to have rather good evidence. We can still have a separate debate if it's reasonable, but you have to really trust your your evidence as as, mm-hmm. as well. Um, but what you're describing there sounds actually quite difficult. Uh, for me, it would be... In, well, maybe you can't give away such secrets, but has has sort of experiments been run in where you try to get people to can you actually beat our system in, in terms of uh, tests well, I, that's maybe a, a secret I don't, it's not something I'm aware of um, mm-hmm. I think one of the issues with doing I think uh, I think Daniel Dubov has actually offered to do something mm-hmm. like that at some point um, the problem is some of the anti-cheating requirements do involve just switching on a camera so mm-hmm. you would have to, you know, once the camera's on, we know it's you. So. <laughs> um, yeah. It would have, be, have to be something that's kind of arranged secretly with the mm-hmm. the kind of leadership of chess.com separate from the fair play team. I, I don't know if these tests have been done or not. I'm not. I'm really not no. sure. No, I mean, guess also... you, but you would have to find someone. You know, I mean, Dubov is probably a good idea, but he's also publicly talked about it. So we, yeah, we could no, I mean, you now. could have me, you could have me playing, but the problem, if I was playing and was cheating as a test, 
I would affect the, the standings also, right? I mean, it's very difficult yeah. to to do it in a sort of real environment without messing up with with, with things. Um, yeah, you would mess but, up the environment, and you would also, you know, be cheating other people, which is well, I exactly. You, I mean, and, some guy will say, "Okay, I didn't. Uh, well, I got knocked out by you, and I understand it was an experiment, but uh, well, it kind of hurt me, right?" It was the, no. Yeah, <laughs> and it's uh, and also I. I do think that certain cheating cases, like, I am absolutely sure a strong Grandmaster could cheat for a single game and not get caught. Like, I'm 100% confident that that is a thing that could happen. And it's a thing that could probably happen in Over the Port Chess. Like, if someone decides I'm going to cheat for one game, I'm going to find a way to get someone sends me a message or, you know. For a single game, I think it's possible. And I don't think it's particularly difficult but i think as time goes by the chances of you getting caught only increase more and more and Mm -hmm. i think you know it it's possible to maybe cheat for a whole tournament that would be fine that would i that wouldn't surprise me massively cheating for an entire year i really don't think that that's realistic and I also I have a lot of uh, doubts about this idea that you can cheat for one or two moves per game and just crush everyone. Well, I think in online chess, less so. But it also depends. I mean, well, we have debated it at a world championship level that, I mean, well, you will only have to cheat rarely. But of course, well... It cannot be that uh, you say, well, we cheat at move 25. That would not matter. Uh, but it would help if you have someone like, well, uh, I mean, monitoring the game. And when it's an important moment, you basically raise your hand. That would matter a lot. And of course, you would only cheat in terms of helping for very specific moves. But you're basically monitoring the whole game. So that I think that will be cheating all the time. So that's probably not what you're talking about, right? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think, you know, it, it comes from the idea that if if Magnus has shown a position and he's like, you know, mm-hmm. what do we think about this position? He'd probably find the right move, but maybe he won't. If you tell Magnus there's a win in this position, he'll find it, yeah. you know, I mean, a very it, high it, percentage of the time. It was very close to messing up the 2014 World Championship match with this famous double blunder in Anand against uh, Carlsen because... Uh, Magnus, well, was much better, but he made a huge blunder. And mm-hmm. people could see it, and they started streaming towards the playing hall. Well, Anand didn't notice, but, I mean, that is a massive tell. If you can see suddenly journalists come, imagine people coming there with camera and uh, things like this. Yeah. Um, and they changed the rules, so now you can enter only each 15 minutes, which, of course, is ridiculous from a spectator point of view. But it gives away how little info we are afraid of. I think... Um, during the Sofia World Championship match in 2010. I'm not fully aware of it, but I think we had a guy who was sort of taking care of security. At least I remember at some point I came back to our analysis room. Uh, we went for dinner and suddenly all the lights were off and there was this uh, teammate, well, not, well, Team Vichy teammate was going around uh, with a flashlight and checking the walls for, for cameras. But I think he was also in the playing hall. And I think some were saying, well, you have to think like a magician. Which kind of signal can be given? And he was looking for that. Um, well, wish yeah. you won the match, which is a pretty good sign that uh, nothing bad happened there, right? But, um, of yeah. course, I think at that level, you can do certain stuff. And it will not help you or even me beat Magnus. But if you are sort of competitive already, then it starts becoming important. Yeah, No, I, I definitely agree in classical chess. It could be a big mm-hmm. problem. But, I mean, even... Yeah. In Blitz, I just don't think it's enough. Like, no. And I think, you know, the amount of winning positions that top players lose yeah. in Blitz is astronomical. And I, I just don't think it's enough in a Blitz game to get to plus three and go, okay, I'll score, you know, 100% here. They're, like, they're I mean, willing classical for sure, but, or not exactly 100%. But, you know, you know, if you give it most top players a plus three position over the board, they're going to mm-hmm. convert that. In a blitz game, I don't think it's the case. And I think even against, you know, if you give a lot of very strong grandmasters a plus three position against Magnus or Hikaru with less than two minutes on the clock, 
I don't think it's the conversion is. Well, also, it, also, it depends. Are we talking about an equal position with yeah, an extra yeah, bishop? I, I know or is, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, you know, well, a complex position. Saying, I mean, let's say the two of us team up for Title Tuesdays. You are playing. I sit with a computer and give you moves. This is going to go wrong in so many ways. Well, one thing is that we'll be caught, but we will not be able to pull it off. Uh, I assume. Right? I mean, no, I, I, I don't think it would be enough. Like, I think you. I, yeah, I think it would be very difficult. And I think, you know, with the stakes being so low in Title Tuesday, yeah, yeah. that is, it's unrealistic. And, okay, yeah, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about is people being paranoid in chess, uh, which we talked about a little bit last week. And I think maybe paranoia is not exactly the the best word to describe it because it, paranoia tends to be unjustified. And I think, you know, the paranoia that, chess players have towards cheating is maybe unjustified in the extent but not unjustified in the the fact of it existing you know if someone gets bitten by a dog i think it's very clear that they're going to be a little bit more paranoid the next time they come across a dog and that's entirely natural and human reaction towards self-preservation i think when it comes to online cheating a lot of basically every single top player every single grandmaster has at some point faced someone who's cheated against them online and i think in the case of these cash prize tournaments that is a, a crime you know, crimes are being committed they, they are a victim of fraud and i think it's completely natural to suspect you know some i mean personally when i play online i often come across very obvious cheaters and although it doesn't massively bother me I'm always a little bit more suspicious about my next opponent, even though those two games have nothing to do with each other. Those two opponents have nothing to do with each other. Um, but the idea is planted in your head, and it's I think it's entirely reasonable for your reaction to be, yeah, I should be more worried about this than is maybe necessary. And so I do think that the reaction of the players is very natural. And I think... It is where chess.com and FIDE do have a responsibility to protect the players, and it shouldn't really be the players' jobs. Like I, I think Kramnik is wrong about a lot of the things he said, but I think the what's got Kramnik to this point is not necessarily his fault. Because the reality is he's definitely played cheaters online. Like 100% he's played against people, probably entitled Tuesdays, they have cheated against him. And that's what's led him down this road. And I think, yeah, that's where we we need to kind of protect players before they get to the point. Because I think it's very difficult to come back from that level of of paranoia once the idea, once the seed is like planted in your brain. Uh, it's a good point. And I, I really like sort of well, language matters and calling it paranoia. I mean, I think you point to that we should probably use worry instead. It's a much more reasonable term to, to use, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. paranoia basically, I, I, my English is not good enough, but it implies some kind of uh, that you are wrong or that you are borderlining mad to a certain extent. And here we say, well, these are justified worries. We, can, we don't know the extent. What, of course, I'm afraid of is also that, well, we slide in the direction we saw in, in cycling years back that, well, people were worried that was cheating and then, well, at some point, everybody ends, ends up cheating and everybody finds it justified because, well, what else to do? Either you suck or you cheat, seems to be. I'm not at all saying that's where we are in chess. No way. But um, if you start sort of believing that no one gets caught, uh, it becomes a very bad situation. But also, for, for a rare thing to defend FIDE uh, and well, certainly also chess.com, I mean, what can actually be done to, to help this? Because it, it sounds very difficult. I, th I think it is very difficult. And I, I want to say that over the board chess, is, the problems are completely different from the, the kind of three layers that we talked about earlier. I think over the board chess, there's a lot more that you can do because there's a lot more physical barriers. And I, I do think FIDE has a responsibility to... They, they do actually have quite good rules regarding, you know, people shouldn't be wearing watches, for example, uh, but they need to be enforced. As far as what chess.com can do, I don't work with anti-cheating in my job, although I kind of am aware of the 
some of the things they do and some of the people who work in it. I know that they take this subject incredibly seriously, and it is the there's a few people who work at one of the kind of high level cases, and they're very strong chess players as well as being you know pretty. They have a pretty good understanding of kind of the methods and the algorithms along this. Mm-hmm. You know, having some experience of playing against these people as well. So it's something that they spend, you know, a pretty serious amount of money on because I think it's very easy to forget that online chess as as a career path or as a a kind of big money event didn't exist pre COVID. Like mm-hmm. they're all very new events. And, you know, we had we had the Speed Chess Championship that's been going for a while, but other than that kind of once a year event and title Tuesday was was smaller. It wasn't played every week. Magnus didn't play before COVID as well, which you can need it. A smaller event. So all of these things have grown a lot over the last two years, and it's definitely yeah, there there has to be some time to catch up with them. And I think it's difficult to to measure things. I think as far as I'm concerned, like the highest level events probably probably all need to be over the board. I think Title Tuesdays and the Champions Chefs, but it it's very difficult to kind of balance the accessibility with the um with anti cheat things as well. You know, like Title Tuesday everyone can play every week and they can play wherever they are in the world. And with the Champions Chefs Tour qualifier in particular, you know, you can get 150, well, I think it's about 100 Grandmasters usually play in the qualifier. Well, I, I'm getting invited. At some point I thought, ah, it fits my calendar. Maybe I should try to play. But then I realized I simply didn't have the technological equipment to play. As you said, mentioned, you need to have two cameras and different kind of things, which is completely reasonable. But mm-hmm. if, I mean, to be able to be allowed to play, you actually have to go to some length, which is, is cool. Yeah, there, there are some requirements, but still the barrier for entry is a lot lower than if you wanted to go play a tournament of that level of in, course, real, of in real life. You know, you you can still do it from, from your home. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, you don't want to entirely throw that kind of thing away. But also, you know, the Champions Chess Tour Finals is going to be played over the board, um, which I think is the correct decision because, you know, you still at some point have to prove yourself in a arena where cheating is more or less impossible. Like, I don't think anyone really thinks people are cheating over the board and wrapping in blitz. No. Well, also, I mean, we spoke about how difficult it is to get all the world's best players to go to Samarkand or any other place in the world. I mean, having events like this is a huge gift to chess. But, I mean, you can get the best world player to play the same event and they can play for wherever they are. It cuts so much cost and uh, traveling for, for players. But then we have to get it uh, working, of course. And uh, no, it's an interesting uh, balance. I think also what you mentioned, I I don't know much about the anti-cheating of neither chess.com or FIDE, but I, I think I spoke with, uh, well, Danny Ranch at some point, and he didn't tell me much, but I was rather impressed. I mean, it was clear that, for instance, some thoughts I had, he said, yeah, yeah, we implemented that, and we did several other things as well. I mean, it basically struck me that they are quite secretive, but they are on a pretty high level in some in, in some way, right? And as you mentioned, it sounds like they have hired people who are both elite chess players, but also understand the other things. And for me, I always felt that, well, you can have someone like Regan, who is a statistical expert and a decent chess player, but not a sort of elite professional who understand the details there. And you can find elite professionals like uh, Kramnik, for instance, who lacks the mathematical skills and there's nothing wrong with that because to get to that level of expertise they have it's a it's a life work but if chess.com actually have found the few people in the world who can do both it sounds good yeah i mean i think we haven't re- i haven't spoken about any of the statistical methods that they used or the algorithms or anything like that in all honesty it's not something i have a ton of knowledge about i have a bit of knowledge about it from kind of things i've picked up but i don't it's definitely not my area of expertise and it's not something I could... Well, it's not something I probably should reveal to the public, but also I, I don't think it's something I'm capable of, of explaining. 
But yeah, it's something they take very seriously. And I think as, you know, time goes by, things will get more more and more serious. I think, you know, there are also kind of barriers to how much anti-cheating that you should have for each tournament. And I think as the prize funds get higher, the anti-cheating should get higher. And I think, yeah, with Title Tuesday, I think the Title Tuesday is one of the more relaxed tournaments for anti-cheating, but it's still a case of, you know, you you can be called into a Zoom call at any time. You can be asked to turn your camera on and share your screen at any time. That's not something that happens consistently over the, you know, the 11 rounds to 500 players because that's not possible. That's not practical. Um, but it's something that happens, you know, as the tournament go- progresses, you know, people who are overperforming or people who are in the lead yeah. will get checked during the event. And it is, you know, there is a team who work on every title Tuesday. Like, well, you are not saying just there, one is ba- guy. <laughs> there is basically someone sitting there who's monitoring the event and can jump in at a certain point, right? Yeah, like, the, uh... Several people. There, there's a t- yeah, yeah. Basically, I, I think one of the really interesting things about title Tuesdays is that the Chess.com doesn't do their own commentary for this event, which is unusual, but they probably spend more resources on having a whole team of anti-cheating people. So you don't have commentators, you don't have production guys, you don't have all these people. Mm. Basically, it's all the anti-cheat people are kind of in a group, and they do every title Tuesday as a team. And I'm not sure how big the group is, but it's you know quite a few people. But also, I mean, you were earlier describing what chess does come does. It's more like uh, consumer protection. And here it's a bit the same. They actually have a brilliant product. And, uh, well, they have to protect the integrity of it, right? I mean, if you uh, well, start losing the, the integrity, people will start leaving, and that would be that would be a s- sad for chess in, in a way. I mean, well, I think chess.com is the one who has the really strong incentive to get these things right, and that's also, of course, they invest a lot of resources in it. Well, for FIDE, maybe, well, they are mainly doing over-the-board stuff. It's, it's different problematics to a certain extent, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the whole over-the-board cheating issues. Is... It's a kind of, it is a separate thing because I think the techniques used are different um, and mm-hmm. the methods yeah. to detect them are different. I think in a lot of ways, over-the-board chess is a big advantage that there are physical barriers towards to preventing cheating. and like. But FIDE de- definitely has to do more to... I, I think the rules are probably good enough. I, th- I would like to see more delays. I, th- I think delay... In the broadcast is should be standard practice, but you know we discussed that last week. And... That uh, yeah, that one I really, I, it's I, I really hate it, but maybe it's a necessity. I would much rather have we could do without. But um, maybe. yeah, I mean I, for big events, I would just have a delay and uh, a complete embargo on anyone posting about it for the time of the delay. Like players yeah, can't just go en- straight on Twitter and enfor- you know. enforce it, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as far as fans go, like, I don't think we have a huge audience of real life fans. And I think I mm-hmm. I would be very happy to inconvenience 20 people if it means protecting the integrity of the event, because mm-hmm. that's to me, that's much yeah. more important. And it's the, the over the board audiences are just so small. Like, we're. No, no, uh, of course. I mean,. Of course, that that is not a an issue. This is actually whenever I go to a sort of real sporting event or a concert, it always shocks me. You can get so many people into a hall because when you go to a chess event, I mean, there can be twenty spectators. I mean, sometimes chess brags when they have five hundred. It's not a very big number in sort of uh, real life terms, right? So, other than the Olympiad, which was definitely thousands. But that's players, of course. Not, no, not no, in, in, no, no, spectators. You're right. Spectators. You're Every right. day there was thousands of yeah. spectators, for sure. But maybe, like, at some point, Norway broke all kind of normality because you could have it on television. I guess India can break all kind of normality. You could probably actually fill a stadium with spectators, uh, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, the opening ceremony at the for the Olympiad that was basically a stadium full of people. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know what the kind of scenario was with giving out tickets, or if they sold the tickets, or how that worked. But the, I guess it was probably. I mean, it, it is hard to guess big numbers yeah, when you're in in the crowd. But I would be amazed if it was less than five thousand. And I would. Yeah, but also, I mean, already to, to get that many people to come for free is a huge achievement. I mean, well, we can talk about selling them tickets later. But if you can get, uh, you know, f- five uh, digit numbers, uh, it's already extremely impressive. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. 
Okay, so I guess we, we should end on a positive note because probably we'll never manage oh. that in any other week. <laughs> no, it, yeah, we can try, but I don't think we're going to succeed. But anyone, anyway, thanks for everybody who uh, hanged in here for, for the whole thing and for you, for you as well. See you some point, maybe next week, yeah? Yeah, hopefully. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.